Thank you, Tanika. Is there a way we can confirm if Renee McVicker is online with us? Hello, hello. Hi, Renee. Hi. While, while we're waiting to see you, know that we miss you. Could you tell <laughs> us, um, just, just tell us a little bit about the, your position. Awesome. Well, thanks, Tricia. Great to be with you online. And one day I will be with you in person. Yeah, so a little bit uh, about me and my position. So I'm Renee McVicker, and I fell in love with Jesus, became a follower of Jesus as a young adult while studying at university. And I now live in a small little town outside Moncton, New Brunswick, Canada, called Salisbury. And today we're getting our first snowfall of the season. So that's fun. It looks beautiful, but it won't last. So it's okay. Uh, and so I've been in ministry for 25 years. I'm married to Joe and we have two kids, Emma, who's 17, Isabel, who's 12. Uh, and truth be told, I'm addicted both to running and my morning coffee. And so this past September, I just started as the new executive minister for the Canadian Baptists of Atlantic Canada. And we are a denomination in Atlantic Canada that have a vision of joining God in our neighborhoods. And so we're a family of churches that seek to do whatever it takes to join God in our neighborhoods so that many more people come to know Jesus. And so the, as the executive minister, my role is to be both the spiritual, the visionary, and the executive leader of our denomination. And our denomination is about 400 Baptist churches spread across our four beautiful Atlantic provinces. So that's New Brunswick, Prince Edward Island, Nova Scotia, Newfoundland, and Labrador. And we formed as a denomination way back in 1905 to try to help all our leaders and churches be effective in our mission. And we're mostly uh, smaller churches, uh, but we're strong churches, and we have lots of wonderful partner organizations uh, that help us in our mission. It's wonderful. When you say smaller churches, what does that mean? Yeah, so some of our churches would have 20, 30 people, uh, and our biggest churches would have around 1,000 people. About how many of those churches are a thousand in worship? Yeah, not very many. Probably, probably only two I can think of that are actually at the thousand or close to the thousand mark in Atlantic Canada. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I think that's true for many of us in many of our places. We tend to think that churches are always large, but for many of us, myself included, our churches are smaller. Sometimes twenty-five, the thousand in worship is is rare at least for dc and i'm i'm hearing that in, in your area too so if today is the first snowfall and you're yeah. this huge vast area how do you get to your churches a lot of driving a lot of mileage good winter tires are key and those tires have already been changed out on the 30th of october <laughs> Mine haven't yet, but I have an appointment coming up later this week to get my winter tires on. So that's another thing many of us don't do anymore. Yeah. <laughs> oh, we definitely put on winter tires here. Everybody in Canada, huh? <laughs> I don't even know if people in upstate New York, anybody here from upstate, change your tires anymore. But wow, that that's quite that's really exciting and inspiring. I also see that you're involved with all the different age groups and it's great to see you on Facebook engaging and you give your videos. Is it every week that you get on and give an update? The joy of the Lord exudes from you, Renee. And it's really encouraging Thank you, Tricia. to see that. Um, you're the first woman in your position. Is that correct? Correct. In Atlantic Canada, uh, you're going to meet another lady in just a moment. That was the first executive minister in all of Canada uh, as, a, as a female. Um, she beat me by a few months to be the first in Canada, which I cheer her on. Yeah. And you've been involved with NABF and with BWA even before you took on this position. What are some of the things you've done with BWA and or NABF before even taking this leadership? Position. Yes, I'm so glad to already know the great friendships and partnerships in the NABF and Baptist World Alliance. 
So previous to this role, uh, a few years ago, I just was in serving in a church for three and a half years. But before that, I was the director of youth and family in the same denomination in Atlantic Canada. And through that, I served with the BWA, BWA and, uh, and some connections with the NABF uh, through that role on the youth committee and uh, had done the beautiful trip to Switzerland and a few other wonderful places like Washington to uh, join with you in fellowship and encourage each other um, and work on our youth committee. And I was all set to go to Rio to the BWA and I was very excited and my husband Joe was very excited because he has never been outside of Canada in his life. And so we were all set to go to Rio for BWA. And then, of course, we all know what happened and none of us traveled anywhere. And uh, so I did a little workshop online for BWA in Rio instead of getting to go to Brazil in person. But one of these days we'll be back together in person. Well, and I'm looking at Julie Justice Williams, who just shared a little bit ago with us about Brisbane. And so we're hoping that you and Joe are counting on those days to come and go down under we hope so that would be wonderful um before we close our time how can we pray for you <laughs> answering that question directly uh, yes thank you i really appreciate the support and prayers from the family yeah three big things i'm asking for prayer for courage dependence on the lord and for my family so courage to make the changes that are necessary so we become even more effective at being a family of churches that share the good news of Jesus in our communities long into the future. Uh, dependence on God, uh, as there's so much to do, especially early in the role, and I need God's discernment, particularly around priorities. Uh, so pray I just listen to God and be dependent on God step by step. And for my family, as we navigate a very full season in our host household, that God would uh, give us and bless our time together. So courage, dependence on the Lord and family would be wonderful. Thank you. Well, let's let's pray for Renee. Oh, God, we give you thanks for Renee and for her ministry in Atlantic Canada. We give you praise for the joy that exudes from her being. And Lord, we ask that you bless her. Give her courage. May she always be dependent on you. And God be with her family. In these days of change, in these days of new development, in these days of teenagers, be their strength. And God, may she know that she is never alone, that she is surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses who have gone before her and who are with her today women and men who seek to hold up her arms, even as those who held up the arms of Moses, that she might be about the good work and sometimes dangerous work that you've set before her. Keep her safe as she drives through snow and rain and ice and sunshine and bring her home always to her husband, Joe, and to their beautiful daughters. Bless her now as she blesses others in the name of Jesus, who is our hope, we pray. Amen. Thank you so much. Being with us. My pleasure. Good to you so see much. you in person someday, I'm sure, all of you. <laughs> Thank you. We will now hear from Wayne Faison. He made a video greeting for us. He is the new executive with the Baptist General Association of Virginia, just a couple hours down the road, works with Dean Miller. Hello, my name is Dr. Wayne Faison. I am the new executive director at the Baptist General Association of Virginia. It's so, so wonderful uh, to be with you this morning to introduce myself briefly. I've been serving as a new executive director. It'll be one year uh, next month, and I'm looking forward to the BJV as we celebrate our 200th year anniversary. God has been so good to us over the years, and I'm certainly, certainly glad he has called me 
to serve for such a time as this. I also serve as senior pastor of East End Baptist Church in Suffolk, Virginia. And I'm so glad that God has called me to do both and and not necessarily either or. This way I get a chance to participate with my fellow brothers and sisters in Christ as we continue to advance the kingdom as God endows upon us his Holy Spirit to help us to transform our community, to transform our nation, and to transform our world. As we talk about the work of the BGAV, it extends over these last couple of centuries. And for me, for me, I have served the, the Baptist General Association of Virginia for the last 22 years, for the last 22 years. And so what has attracted me to the BJV is its focus on mission and its focus on freedom. And I'm so, so glad that this is still at the forefront of who we are as Virginia Baptists. We know that the COVID pandemic has really wrecked havoc on many of our churches, many of our partners, many of the regional judicatories, many of the denominations. You know the feeling because you are experiencing it too. But I'm so glad that we have the opportunity to partner. I'm so glad we have the opportunity to collaborate. I'm so glad that we have each other as we continue to do as God has called us to do. In terms of who we are as Virginia Baptists, we are certainly, certainly uh, focused on the local church and trying to empower our local church, trying to help our lo local churches experience restoration and renewal and empowerment and fulfillment, fulfilling what they believe God is calling them to do so that they can see transformation not only inside the church, but also outside the church. And we know that God is doing a great thing, even in the midst of all of the swirling winds that are going on around us. And so we're just going to shore up and stand on each other's shoulders, lock arm in arm with one another as we continue to do what God has called us to do. And also in terms of who we are as uh, Virginia Baptist, uh, in terms of missions, we not only look at our local mission, but we also look at our global connections. And so I know you know the term of being local, where you're locally rooted, but you're also globally focused. And so we just enjoy this opportunity to spread our wings all across the world and to connect with our faith kin so that we can have mutual learning, so that we can have mutual missions, so that we can have mutual collaboration. Because we know for a fact that God's church is not just in the local setting, but God's church is in the global setting. And so we're so, so excited to connect with our brothers and sisters all across the world, many different tongues and languages and cultures. And that just excites us because we want to see God in the fabric of his creation. And that fabric of his creation includes you and it includes me and it includes our brothers and sisters all around, all around the world. So in terms of uh, how you can pray for us, first of all, I just want you to know that we're praying for you. We are praying for you. And so as you think in terms of including us in your prayer, pray, please pray that the God will continue, which we know that he will, to endow upon us the power of his Holy Spirit and let us be obedient to the light that he's shining in our path so that we might move forward in order to uh, share the gospel of Jesus Christ, not only in our communities, but all across the world. And pray for those who have uh, uh, continuing to experience grief and loss. We know that things are certainly not the same, but even in the midst of this difference, there is something that God wants us to do. And so whether or not we can be a source of hope we can be a source of healing. We can be a source of unity. That's what we need prayer for. And so I thank God for this opportunity for me to come before you, to introduce myself to you. I thank God for allowing me the opportunity to share a little bit of, uh, of what God has called us to do here at the BGAV, the Baptist General Association of Virginia. And most of all, I thank God for having this opportunity where we can come together and call upon the name of the Lord through our prayer. God bless you. I look forward to meeting you in person very, very soon. And I look forward to journeying together as we move into the future of what God has in store for us. God bless you. Have a wonderful, wonderful day.
Let's pray for Wayne and for the BGAV. Oh God, we give you thanks for the 200 year history of the Baptist General Association of Virginia, for her witness locally in the local church, in local communities, and all around the world. God, we pray that the BGAV will continue to seek your Holy Spirit and to be obedient to the movement forward of your spirit. And as Wayne requested, God, we pray for grief and for loss. We pray that the BGAV will be able to enter into those places offering hope, healing, and unity. And God, when those days become challenging as the new leader, though he's been there for many years, God, be his strength and his stamina. Send people his way to join him, to hold up his arms, to be about this work set before him for such a time as this. God, we thank you that you hear our prayers and that you connect us even when we cannot be together. For we are united in Christ our Lord, in whose name we pray. Amen. We're now going to enter into a Zoom conversation with Leanne Friesen. Canadian Baptist Churches of Ontario and Quebec. Hello. Hi, we can't see you quite yet, but I think we will in a moment. Sure. There you are. Hi, Leanne. Welcome. Thank you. We're glad that you're with us. Thank you very much. And we just got off the call with Renee. Yes. Who told us that you became the first woman in all of Canada to lead a denominational body by just a little bit before her? It's no competition. Yes, she's celebrating. Not a competition. She's hilarious. Uh, we we have joked about this often. Uh, certainly, much was made uh, when my position was announced in April about this being a historic role. But what was pretty neat was that it was at our assembly the day that I was ratified. Was the same day they announced that Renee was going to be considered that she was the name they were bringing forward in Atlantic Canada. So I prefer, as opposed to focusing on me being the first, to just celebrate that women are stepping into these roles and uh, how exciting that there's now two of the four of us. So Canada is a big country. Many of you will know this, of course. Um, we're the same tradition. Uh, with uh, There's four kind of uh, pieces of us across the country. So Renee would be Atlantic Canada. And then we have uh, the French Union, which would work uh, in Quebec and a little bit in New Brunswick and a little bit in Ontario with French-speaking churches. Then I'm Ontario and Quebec with our non-French churches in Quebec. I can't say English-speaking because some of them speak Russian, some speak Ukrainian, Mandarin, Cantonese. Um, and then we have uh, Rob Ogluvia West uh, for Western Canada. So we would be four sister sisters among this Canadian Baptist family. Well, it's very exciting. It is a new day in Baptist life when half of the <laughs> Baptists in Canada are by women. That's exciting. Mm -hmm. Now, Renee told us she had snow today. Did you also have snow? No, I'm quite a distance from Renee. Um, <laughs> so sorry, Renee, that stinks. <laughs> we'll get it soon enough, I'm sure. Uh, but yeah, I'm in Southern Ontario. So about an hour from Toronto. Wonderful, wonderful. So what are the things that are you, you're most excited about with your ministry right now? It's an exciting time. It's a difficult time, too, as many of you, I'm sure, are experiencing. Coming uh, back from COVID comes with its many challenges. And so we're journeying with our churches and those very real realities. Again, similar to Renee, uh, we have lots of small churches as well that are figuring out what the future is going to look like and how they can be thriving um, but what I see is just lots of potential, and I see excitement for the future. And I think coming out of these last few years, we've also seen all these new opportunities and ways to think about ministry. So I think this is an exciting season. Right now, um, I'm pretty new to this role. I was It was official in May. I, joined, I came on this role in May. Um, and so I'm doing lots of learning and figuring out what's really needed and what's going on. But for me, every day is another moment of seeing how God's at work, which is exciting. Wonderful, wonderful. As as you're leading and as you're getting to know your churches, you named off many, many languages that are spoken. <laughs> yeah. uh, do you travel with an interpreter or do you get <laughs> when you get to uh, 
you that's a great question. No, that's very interesting. So um, we work, um, I, I don't know how familiar people are here with Canada, but Toronto is considered the most multicultural city in the world. Um, and so Toronto is a unique country, uh, city in that actually less than 50% are people who were born in Canada in that, in that city. So I uh, live in the GTA, the greater Toronto area. We, of course, serve all of Ontario and, and a number of places in Quebec, um, but all throughout Canada immigration and, of course, in all our various cities and, and states and uh, countries, uh, we're seeing an increase in immigration. And so this has a, quite a significant impact on our churches. Um, I don't travel with an interpreter. Most of our churches would still speak English, um, but we do have a significant number of churches. And our largest churches, when you ask Renee how many churches you have, over a thousand, we would have about, uh, I think, about 10, and they would all be uh, our Chinese churches. So those are our large churches, and they're speaking Mandarin and Cantonese. Most of those churches would have a Mandarin congregation, a Cantonese congregation, and an English congregation. And so usually when I go there, um, it's very easy to find an interpreter. And one of the interesting realities that's happening in those churches now that you can be thinking of is with the changes in policies in Hong Kong is that there's now this huge uh, surge of immigration from Hong Kong. And so our Cantonese speaking churches are absolutely bursting at the seams. And I was talking to some of our Cantonese pastors last weekend, their churches have doubled and tripled in a year. And it's all brand new, non-English speaking, often people who are quite older in their lives, coming to live with their children and so on. So that creates really interesting challenges and opportunities for their churches. Mm, wow, that's exciting and challenging, I'm sure. But <laughs> it's interesting to see how we just heard from Wayne talk about global engagement. I mean, yeah. exactly what this is all about. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. To realize the percent of, of... Yeah, we just had our new pastor's orientation, which we do a couple of times a year. There were 16 uh, new pastors there that are, are joining our denomination. Uh, three of them were white, and which I think is, we just think that's so exciting. And so we just are so thankful for how God has brought us uh, these wonderful pastors from other countries that have often come to Canada as a place of refuge, and now they're able to help serve. And we think this is really going to be the future of some of our churches that are small and struggling, that sometimes are finding gaps, finding pastors. Uh, in the some of the traditional means we used to use, which maybe some of you have seen. And this is a beautiful blessing to us that we're very excited about. As you know, our sister Jennifer Lau is here. Yes, hi, Jennifer. <laughs> Interesting, even just in these conversations, to talk about how much we overlap and how we see the kingdom and kingdom of God being developed mm -hmm. in our own towns and our own communities as the world comes and crosses and and all of these pieces and, and the new issue of the elder Cantonese people coming. That, mm. That's really powerful. Well, Leanne, I'm, I'm also having to be mindful of the time. Of what course. Are the we can pray for you. Yeah, I would, I would ask similar to Renee's prayers, but uh, I would just ask for wisdom. So this is a season of lots of discernment, uh, determining where to spend time, where to focus, how to deal with issues as they arise. So in this time of transition, wisdom is my, is, whenever, I ever answer, whenever anyone asks me that question, which is a lot because people are eager to be supportive, I always say wisdom. Mm -hmm. Anything else you'd like to add for your prayers? Well, you can be certainly praying for our churches and uh, all of those churches that are, as, as I mentioned, that are going through, again, what going through what all of your churches are going through as well i'm sure that transition and, and learning what it will mean to do ministry as we step into the future wonderful well let's thanks pray. for having me yeah let's if it's okay we'll take some time to pray for you is that okay absolutely oh god we give you thanks we thank you for leanne and for the joy that she brings to the table we thank you for the potential that is there that is coming to Toronto, not just waiting to be dusted off, but is coming even in days like this, for this exciting season, God, where the possibilities are endless, the potential is there and is coming, and your world comes to a city like Toronto. God, we pray for Leanne to have wisdom, wisdom that allows her to have the courage she needs to lead 
the stamina that she needs to lead, the ability to know when to say no, and the opportunities that she creates to rest, to recreate, to be refreshed. God, give her wisdom. God, be with the churches in Toronto and Quebec. Give them the courage to do that which you have called them to do. Guide them and lead them into this new creative future. A future that holds tight to the good news of Jesus Christ. Which welcomes all to your table. God, be with Luann. Wash over her with your spirit she seeks to be obedient to your call. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Thank, Thank you, you so much for being with us. Blessing. My pleasure. Our next interview is live and in person. Raphael, will you come join me, please? a little bit about your ministry. Yeah, so I, I came in uh, about a year ago uh, as the executive director of the uh, French uh, Baptist Union. So you knew my predecessor, David Rollet, uh, who was there for 10 years. And um, he was my mentor way back when uh, I came back to France. And uh, so I'm just following into his steps. Yeah. So are you originally from Canada or from France? I am from France. I was born in Strasbourg. Okay. And then uh, we uh, I married uh, an American citizen, Karen. Had four kids, and then we lived in Africa, lived in the States, in Europe, and now in Canada. Wonderful. So tell me again, when did you start? About a year ago. A year ago. Wonderful. What gives you the most joy? Um, I think that um, um, serving in a French-speaking context, uh, where we have so few uh, churches, uh, means that um, we have to be totally dependent on God. Uh, because resources are very few, uh, churches are very few, they're very small. And what produces a lot of joy to me is that the uh, the, the Baptist Union, in a sense, um, uh, has agreed that um, the only way forward was through evangelism and missions. So um, I, I see a tendency in the French-speaking world of, of denominations choosing uh, uh, strategies of um, of, um, of collapsing and, and focusing on internal resources. Um, when I when I joined and asked what is it that they wanted me to carry on as a mandate, they said we want to lead people to Christ and plant churches, and we're going to spend all the money we have on that. I said, how much money do you have? He said, that's the number. I said, okay, we have about five years of uh, of, uh, of uh, fuel to put in the engine, and is it okay if we spend it all? And they said yes. And then and then the second question was. Uh, would you be happy if we lead people to Christ and plant churches that would not be Baptist? And they said, no problem. Say that one more time. Yes. Mm -hmm. And that's exactly what I said. said with, <laughs> can you repeat the answer, not the question? And they said, yeah, we want to we want to lead people to Christ and we want to plant churches. If they're not going to be Baptist, that's okay. Uh, we want to uh, finish well. And I said, well, probably if you have a theology of death, um, and it's embedded and incarnated, then probably there's a theology of life that is awaiting for you. Uh, but that's um, that's not preferred. The gospel is just good kingdom theology. Mm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Great. So what does it look like, uh, your your work in Canada? What do the churches look like? Yeah. Um, to give you an, ex an example, okay? I, I was in... Uh, in uh, in a rally of, um, of evangelists and church planners uh, in North America. And uh, I had this, uh, this church planner who was um, sharing in a prayer um, time that um, he didn't want his kids to grow up in a place where evangelicals would only be like, let's say 1% of the population and that would be terrible. And then we need to pray against the wave of secularization uh, that the Lord would bring back revival. And two things came to my mind when uh, he, he, po he posted that request on the table. The first is, um, I hear the pain. 
I hear the pain and I hear uh, pastors just being completely overwhelmed with what is happening in the world today. And uh, engaging the secular mind uh, is complicated. It is super complicated. And the natural uh, reflex is to just cave in and uh, choose the cultural war or political agenda, or just go full throttle into uh, defending our ethics. Um, but that's, um, that's not going to do the work. I've, I've been working in, for 20 years in Europe, which is highly secular, highly cynical, and um, we found ways to engage the secular mind. And actually there's more opportunities than there's threats. And that's uh, what I wanted to share with him. The second thing I wanted to share with him is that actually such a place exists in North America. It's called Quebec. Uh, there's 1% evangelicals there. And, and we're okay. <laughs> yeah, it's not Armageddon yet. Um, uh, we, we, do, we do suffer from systemic oppression from the government who has decided to eradicate uh, religion from the public square. So we need um, on one side to do education for the government officials about what does it mean to live on a public square in a secular age. And then we also need to raise funds to just sue them uh, whenever they uh, just cross the boundary, right? So it's like the good cop, bad cop, uh, and the Baptists are really good about handling both, you know? <laughs> yeah, you hit him and then you put the carrot and then, Somewhere in the middle, we talk. Okay. Yeah. So tell us about your church plans. So um, we are experimenting now with uh, micro church strategies. We've done classical church planting, I guess, for the next you know, for the past ten years, being pretty innovative in that. Um, but with COVID nineteen, we see uh, now new expressions of a micro church, especially in places where, you know, Canada is big, right? And um, if we want to reach out all the French picking uh, pockets, we need to think about starting churches very quickly uh, in places that are about three days of travel. And that means for us, we can't just, you know, ship a church planter uh, that would cost about 80,000, you know, to train and then ship them over there. We need to be able to start really quickly. And so the micro church strategy allows us to do that. Uh, it's very agile in the sense that we can we can, we can see what happens with that group. Either it's going to be transformed into a church plant or it's just going to collapse on its own. But then we don't invest so much in terms of energy and funding and training. Uh, we just want the leader of those micro churches to be good evangelists. So they need to lead people to Christ, disciple them, and then raise leadership. And then if uh, Joe, God chooses to make that a church plant, then we can you know, take, take it further. But uh, the micro church strategy is right now for us a sort of a middle ground between evangelistic initiative, uh, micro church strategy, and then church planting, and then full throttle in a classical church. Mm -hmm. Yeah, fascinating. I'm, I'm watching the time, and I think we could continue the conversation. But I, I need to ask you, what, what can we pray for you? So pray uh, tomorrow. Uh, I won't be able to be with you, but tomorrow at ten o'clock we have a gathering of uh, fourteen denominational leaders of Quebec uh, that forms the uh, network of. Uh, Quebec evangelicals, and the name in French is REC, <laughs> which I assure you is not a REC. It's really, really, really good, <laughs> but that's the doesn't translate. But the energy uh, in the room is is there. I mean, they they, are, they have agreed uh, to be aggressive when it comes to missions, um, and um, and we are uh, tomorrow is going to be a major milestone in the story of evangelicalism in Quebec. Uh, in the sense that um, we need to revitalize our denominations. Most of them have been the fruit of the 1970s revival. And um, I think one thing that the COVID did is that um, uh, older pastors have decided to definitely move to Miami where they're blonde uh, because uh, time is of the essence at this point. And uh, so they're leaving the churches and uh, the next generation that's going to pick them up or you know, 25 to 30 years old. So, uh, yeah, there's a huge generational gap there. Mm, mm, mm. Mm -hmm. All right. Anything else? Uh, no, I think that's, uh, that would be, yeah, with significant events uh, that the Lord would give us uh, wisdom, especially and new partners in terms of, um, yeah, funding those strategies, uh, especially in regards to public theology. It's a big, big topic. Um, um, I'm just going to finish with that. I think if the U.S. is looking at Canada, probably this is what's going to happen in the next 10 years to you. 
But if you want to see what's going to happen in 20 years, look at French picking Canada. This is what's coming in. Mm. So it's exciting in the sense that we're living in a lab. Um, one percent evangelicals and um, the energy is high, especially with the younger generation. So that's mm -hmm. exciting. Yeah. Great. Can we pray for you? Sure. Oh, God, for the gift of your good news, we are grateful. We thank you for this group who will gather tomorrow morning at 10 a.m. We thank you for these 14 leaders who see it essential, essential to pass on the good news of Jesus Christ to the next generation and the next generation. God, we pray for those who go to begin these micro church plants. God, give them wisdom. Give them courage. Give them stamina. Mm. Lord, we pray for the generational gaps and the new opportunities that arise as seasoned pastors retire and new energetic pastors come in. May they not forsake the wisdom of those who have gone before them, but may they also not grow weary in carrying out a new direction by holding on to the good news of Jesus. God, we, we pray for the new partnerships that will arise and for the development of public theology. We pray for the oppression that comes through the government. But we know, God, that often, not always, but often in times of oppression, there are opportunities of great growth. So God, we pray for our brother Raphael as he leads this charge. As he is empowered by your Holy Spirit to share the good news near and far through traditional churches, well-established churches, and churches that are starting quickly. God, be his strength. And I pray that in this group that gathers tomorrow, they will hold each other up, but that they will know that others are holding them up, that they do not walk alone. For the sake of the gospel is far greater than any one movement. And we are all in this together. May we always be reminded that we are sisters and brothers for each other, as Jesus is our brother. And may we all be about sharing, declaring, and living out the good news of Jesus Christ. So bless our brother, O oh God, as he blesses others. In the name of Christ our Lord, we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you. We have two leaders who were unable to be with us. The Baptist General Convention of Texas has elected a brand new leader, Julio Guarneri. And my understanding is he just began like within the last couple of months. So he hasn't started yet. Okay, he's about to start, but he's already been elected. Okay, so here we have him. Um, and so let's pray for Julio. Oh God, in these days of change and transition, we lift up Julio to you as he leads this very large group of Baptists in Texas. God, be his strength. God, we pray that he will have the eyes to see and the ears to hear and the heart that is willing to move as your spirit leads him as there will be many who want to lead Julio. May he keep his eyes on you, God, that he might be about the gospel near and far, that the people of Texas from huge churches to little churches will know of your love and of your support through their executive. God, we pray that you work through him as he navigates these new days. Be his strength. In the name of Christ, we pray. Amen. Converge also has a new leader. John, I'm sorry, about a year, John Jenkins Sr. Let's pray for him. Oh God, we give you thanks for John Jenkins. We thank you for his ministry near and far. God, we pray that you will be his strength. When he becomes weary, we pray that you will send people his way to walk with him and perhaps even to carry him when necessary. God, give him the eyes to see and the ears to hear and the feet that are willing to move in the direction you are calling him and the movement of Converge. 
May they be open to the movement of your spirit, that they might be known as gospel people proclaiming the good news of Jesus Christ. And as a leader, God, we pray that he will be enveloped by supporters who will help him and guide him, who will be honest when he needs to hear the truth, but who will also hold him up. So God bless him as he blesses others. We ask this in the name of Jesus, who is our strength and hope. Amen. Thank you for your prayers.